Yo creo que eh, vamos empezando para mantenernos dentro del... Ok, so let's get started. So we keep to our timing. Be welcome to our panel titled Building Sciences for Peace in Latin America, Interdisciplinary Experiences from Colombia. So some housekeeping note first, as we said, please keep your microphones and your cameras off during our event. We have simultaneous interpreting. However, you cannot access the interpreting function if you are watching this event from your web browser. You had to use the app both on your computers and your mobile or cellular phones. And we have a chat box that is open for you to leave us any questions and comments, and we're going to share them with the panelists. If you have any connection problems, please leave the session and rejoin. That should sort the problem. And if uh, anybody is removed from the session, those people are not going to be allowed back in. Now, just so you know where to access the interpretation, if you go to your Zoom menu at the bottom of the screen, to the far right, you're going to see a globe icon. When you click on it, you're going to have a drop-down menu where you would be able to select the language that you prefer to listen to. If you are joining us from your mobile phones, then you had to um, touch the little three dots at the bottom right of your screens, then select language interpretation and <clears throat> select the language you want to listen to. And then finally click on done. So the interpretation is activated and then you can listen to the language of your choice. Without further ado then, Let's get started. Thank you very much to our panel, Building Sciences for Peace in Latin America, Interdisciplinary Experiences from Colombia. This is um, an, an initiative by the group uh, Sciences for Peace uh, with Valeria, Elena, Maria Fernanda, and myself. We are all scientists from Colombia. And we have the support of the Center for Latin American Studies from UC Berkeley as well as the um, uh, Colombian Association of Evolutionary Biology. We have the Gothenburg Global Biodiversity Center, as well as CIANI, the Swedish International Network Initiative, and FOCALI, the Forest Climate and Livelihood Research Network. Given the serious humanitarian crisis, Colombia has been facing in the last few months is the result of unsolved historical matters that are affecting Latin America more deeply lately. We know that this has uh, been a strong social mobility driver in Colombia, considering the social, social economical conditions of our country. However, these, um, science, this sector in the society, especially sciences, has historically been perceived as objective. And this uh, premise for objectivity has affected the role science has been playing in society and how science responds to the um, events and the development of the social and political context. Therefore, reviewing how Colombian uh, science, uh, the, Col the Colombian science sector feeds and nurtures uh, trends such as neocolonialism, classicism, racism, sexism, homophobia, and others is something that has been long overdue. So we are going to debate from the point of view of social and natural sciences, how science has always shown an interest in researching the effects of war on biodiversity, as well as how we can use this as a jumping board to propose peacekeeping actions or to nature peace efforts. So we are going to move on to our first panelist, 
Dr. Inoki Rodriguez Fernandez, who uh, works as um, a researcher in the School for International Development in the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom, and she specializes in local environment and transformation of conflicts in Latin America. She has also conducted research in Venezuela, Guyana, Ecuador, Bolivia, Chile, and Colombia. And since 2018, she is a co-leader together with the University of Ibagué and Eureka, a project called School, Territory, and Post-Conflict in Sur Tolima. Apologies, we're having some technical problems. We also are joined by Diego Calderón Franco, who is a biologist from the University of Antioquia in Medellín. And in 2007, he founded Colombia Birding, which is the oldest company dedicated to birding and bird watching in Colombia, organizing tours to all areas of our country as well as uh, South America. And he has been sharing his experiences in a talk called Birding with the Farks, where he calls for reconciliation and the construction of a new Colombia. Then we have Dr. Lina Pinto Garcia, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Interdisciplinary Center for Development Studies at the University of uh, the Los Andes in Bogota, as well as a fellow researcher at the Institute for Science, Innovation and Society at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. She um, has background in social studies, science and technology, and is currently researching the relationship between environmental and human health in territories marked by armed violence and extra extractivism. And finally, we are going to listen to Pablo Palacio Rodriguez, who is a doctoral student at the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of the Andes. He graduated with honors as a biologist from the Univers Technological University of Chocó, and he's been working in the um, areas of ecology, as well as with the evolution of poisonous frogs in the Colombian Pacific. He won an award as the um, Afro-Colombian of the year in 2017 and described a new species of poison of frogs named Andinovanates victimatus as a tribute to those victims of armed conflicts in Colombia. We are going to listen to each of our panelists. They're going to talk for about five minutes each. And after that, we're going to move on to a Q&A session where you will be able to ask what you need. So I give the floor to Lina. Lina, maybe you would like to go first. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. I want to check that you can see see my screen and you can hear me okay, right? Yes. But otherwise, please do let me know. Well, I'm Linda Pinto Garcia. And as Camilo very well said, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Interdisciplinary Center for Development Studies at the University of the Andes, as well as a fellow researcher at the Institute for Science, Innovation and Society at the University of Oxford in the UK. So I want to thank for the opportunity to participate in these debates that I always believe are very useful. As you can see, I have an interdisciplinary background and these days I'm working mainly in areas related to technology. So to get started, I would like to go over how science and society and the relationship between both of them has been understood historically. When I say science, I refer to technoscience. I mean, not only the production of um, scientific knowledge, but also the creation and the utilization of technology in different contexts. So the 
historical dominant idea is that science is part of society and that it is that area that produces objective knowledge uh, uh, that derives from observing society and nature and that is never affected by external sources. Therefore, it's always had a dominant voice that comes from this notion that the data and the information produced by science, it's never mediated by anything else. So this is the hegemonic belief that has been pretty much in place since the 1970s. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So, the second approach at, on the back of this first era of scientific understanding is this approach that understands that science and society are interlocked and that there are connections and influences that go both ways, that society determines what science research is and that scientific knowledge also affects our understanding of society. And under this approach then, it's usually understood that science is contaminated by society and compromised by it. And we have, for example, La Liga, the Liga Against Science that usually uh, challenges and questions certain research uh, projects and uh, uses of science, uh, science, such as, for example, fracking. And then there's a third approach, which is the approach that I ascribe to, that understands that science from social sciences to natural sciences is actually a human practice and as such is a cultural pra practice that is embedded within society and that everything that happens in a society has an impact on science because it determines it as science exists in a societal context and that this effect actually again happens both ways because science also has the capacity of influencing the society in which it is embedded. Therefore, there could not be and there will never be a science that is completely apolitical because science is a natural and human phenomenon that exists within a society. It's affected by the context in which it is embedded, but it also affects the context, the context itself. So it is like saying that science is condemned to be and exist immersed in this ever-changing environment. But instead of seeing it under a negative light, understanding the frustration that uh, most people usually feel, we can look at the other side of the coin because we know that lots of science uh, scientists usually feel that they are disconnected from the real world. But if we look at it from the other point of view, and as we said, the other side of the coin, then we understand that science exists, not in a vacuum, but immersed in the reality around it. And then we can start asking questions such as, what would be a more ethical, less colonial, less patriarchal, a more um, equitative way of doing science and scientific research? And then in a violent context, as a context um, that normally exists in the Colombian society, how could we define a science built for war? And by asking these questions, we could perhaps generate awareness because not always scientists are fully aware in how much they contribute to war and armed conflicts. 
Now, from this awareness, we can then start asking ourselves how we could build a science that builds and contributes towards peace and peace efforts. So by interacting and debating with anthropologists, sociologists, and other disciplines that can contribute a different point of view. What I did, for example, was uh, do lots of reading and research related to anthropology and invest time in debating with these other type of scientists that could contribute a more social anthropological point of view. So I could develop a, what I call a biosocial understanding of my role as a scientist. And this is something that we did, for example, in our research of this disease, Lehmaniasis um, cutaneous, which is a disease that people get from a very tiny fly that when it bites, it creates a small laceration that is not painful, but that has spreads and, go and grows and is transmitted in the rainforest. And because it's a disease that exists in those areas, tends to um, affect those involved in armed conflicts, such as guerrillas and paramilitary forces. So two key findings for our debate that I think are going to help us discuss and reflect on the role of science as well as etymological and medical research within the context of armed conflict. I found reading the literature and also talking to many other researchers and scientists as well as doing some field work in the Colombian Pacific, that there's a clinic where they treat patients affected by lesmaniasis. And I came to realize that there is an increasing trend to omit the connection between armed conflicts and the occurrence of this disease. So the disease is treated as an isolated incident without including other type of information on observations, practices, and so on, as if they were unrelated. Now, this happens even though most people affected by leishmaniasis in Colombia are somehow connected to armed conflicts, either people who were involved in paramilitary forces, um, people working in coca fields in Colombia, or maybe individuals of African descent that tend to live in the rainforest region of the country. So as a result, and to wrap up, we have a point of view and an approach from science proposed from the scientific point of view that is excluding our conflict as one of the root causes of this disease. And therefore, it's not included in the scientific narrative. Also, leishmaniasis in this case is diagnosed, treated, researched, and analyzed devoid and as separate of armed conflicts. So armed conflict is not even part of the diagnose process for this disease. And the combination of these two factors entail that although scientists like to think of themselves as neutral parties, excluding armed conflicts and the 
narrative around leishmaniasis is actually a strong political trend because it contributes to reproducing violence by omitting war and also turns a blind eye to a big part of the problem, making it very difficult to address the disease. Therefore, what could we do as scientists and citizens that practice science, then we could either continue to pretend that science is completely neutral, apolitical, and we could also, on the other hand, take on the obligation of communicating and disseminating information in a way that is humble and easy to understand so we can bring scientific knowledge closer to the general public and to those who are in decision-making positions. Another option is to lobby. This involves a more active role and involvement in the political process. And finally, and this is what I think that we could all do, is to constantly question ourselves and include every single way in which our work could be biased or affected by political premises, even if unintentionally. So asking ourselves, for example, such as, where am I doing my field research? How am I involving with the local communities? What am I contributing to them? What kind of dialogue I establish with these communities? And then always keep in mind the power structures around our scientific research. And I know that what I'm saying might sound and seem to be very ambitious. I understand that we cannot do it all, but then that's where interdisciplinary work and exchange comes to play because we can then add to our work contributions by those who are more familiar with structured power, social dynamics, and so on, which are, for example, those scientists working in sociology and anthropology. So an interdisciplinary approach is going to allow us to give more depth to our work and, and uh, understanding it always as uh, part of our academic research. Well, thank you very much, Lina. I think that um, with everything that you said, then you just made our day and our event is more than worth our time. I would like to move on to Diego then. Yes, I'm right here. Thank you. Thank you, Camilo, and thank you, Lina, and to the event organizers, of course, as well as my um colleagues in the panel i'm very honored to be part of this panel because as you will see i'm the uh least academic of them i'm the least uh, scientist of all the panelists here but you can see my screen right now and basically, I want to start my presentation by uh, protesting. I want to bring to our debate and bring to the table Article 22 of the Political Constitution of Colombia. I'm going to keep it with me all the time. And as I was saying, I'm a biologist, 
but I don't have any postgraduate studies in biology. And I'm going to tell you a few things about my life. So I am really a communicator. Oh, um, it is really to see birds as a um, communication mean for the two type of Colombia who had been very much detached and far away from each other. And one of them is that in 2004, when I was in expedition to a mountain ridge to look for some lost uh, birds with um, a local guide, we were seized. We were kidnapped by the front 41 of FARCs. That was in 2004. We spent two, three months in the hills lots of very nice movements in the academic sector and also in the Colombian orthonologistic um, sector. And this kidnap came to an end without knowing that in the future I was going to uh, become a really a bridge or a connector between two Colombias that unfortunately uh, hadn't been able to mix up very much. And the second aspect I would like to share with you was in 2016, as a country, we voted in the referendum to put an end to the conflict with the FARC. And at that moment, uh, I started to really, um, really started to um, get this call to be more involved in politics as a common and citizen. I mean, that was my duty of paying my taxes and go to vote, but I wanted to um, help in some local economic change, which is basically what I do with my um, bird watching activities and my tourism activities every single day. And also without noticing too much at the end of 2017, beginning of 2019, we were filming The Birders. This is a documentary. And interestingly enough, we were finishing this documentary. This is from the Cerro Pintado. Basically, you have Venezuela on the right hand side at the end of this mountain range. And now we were just finishing The Birders. That was the documentary. And that was the place where I was kidnapped. I was using the topic of my kidnap uh, to show that in Colombia, after the uh, peace treaty, although we said no in the referendum as a country, some things were indeed changing and they were moving into the right uh, direction after so many years of having things upside down. And the birders, this documentary, it is a very beautiful uh, show really of music, culture, birds. There's a public source documentary with more than 300,000 views. And it shows a little bit how birds managed to be this bridge, this connecting point between the two faraway Colombias. In 2018, I was a member of the first biological expedition of these uh, 20 first biological expeditions. Ours was number 18th. And one of the most interesting thing was that this was with the former uh, soldiers for the FARC. So these were the front 36 uh, FARC. That was from the northern area of Antioquia. And this expedition, uh, there was a, an ornithologist. I wasn't the former ornithologist, but then they said this expedition uh, was going to have as members uh, former soldiers of FARC. And then he said, you know, I have to go. I have to go to this because I want to work with them. Let's do something beautiful out of this. So we had the fortune of uh, conducting a social experiment with 60 people to go to the countryside and to put together these two faraway Colombians. Here we have students from, we, we all different social classes here. In Colombia, you have former soldiers, you have Colombian peasants. We also have some um, leaders, uh, community leaders. Also, we have international observers. We have TV and video producers from uh, other countries. And it was here where we were able to put together these two Colombias, which has never happened before. And in this um, bio, expeditions uh, from the academic point of view we sort of discovered new species of uh, birds and plants but also we had very important papers uh, published in national geographic and this is one which is very good you can google this the house of life or casa de la vida in spanish and you can look for these it is the public also, it's a public source uh, paper. And once again, we were doing something else on this regard, bringing some people who had been uh, from the community looking at the conflict from the uh, from far away. So with these elements, uh, since 2016, I've always been wondering myself, how sh what should I do as a common citizen uh, to really 
uh, have some kind of um, uh, impact in everything which is going on in uh, Colombia. I, I just invented, really, I made up this talk, which is bird watching with FARC. And in my experience uh, with the uh, armed conflict, I mean, I had good and bad experiences, but this could be with FARC, with any other um, armed conflict and with any kind of ideology right or left. And I started to give these talks throughout 2018. Basically, what I wanted to do this was to really, to pester really people who wanted to sort of uh, get out of the comfort zone. We all live in our comfort zone and I want people to get out of the comfort zone. And basically it was a story that I wasn't making it up. Basically, uh, I was just um, uh, talking about this story. I was just uh, having the good fortune to um, sort of, I mean, sort of saying I was kidnapped a few years ago, and now I had the privilege to work with uh, former soldiers and to follow them up in some of the processes that they were going through, and to be able to show these to people once again to bother them, bother them in in a nice way, because for most people in Colombia, this rural context of Colombia and the former soldiers something very far away, and now with a national strike, we've seen that again. So this um, set of uh, talks, uh, which I called uh, bird watching with the fox reached many, many people. And right before the pandemic also, I was also doing these talks abroad. And that was the way I was able to have a project to be able to show and once again to bother in a good and nice way. That's what I feel something, I mean, nice that I do this because I want to sort of, as I said, bother some people who are very far away from this Colombian reality. Some other projects, and I want to make this very clear, um, uh, I, I, I've, I've been very privileged to sort of um, just jump on what other people were doing when I'm talking about this project, uh, but watching with FARC. Here we have, once again, at the background, we have the mountain range of Cerro Pintado. This picture would have been wouldn't have been possible 10 years ago. Here we have former soldiers of FARC who are also now working as a TV and audio production. We also have uh, some uh, international uh, visitors using this tourism uh, product they are offering. Also, we have producers, uh, dear friends from Medellin and from England. So what we did here is to go back to this place, to this spot where I was kidnapped. I met people. Uh, this uh, picture is with Eileen. She's, um, she's a, she was a minor when I was kidnapped, and she, uh, I mean, basically, she didn't know what she was doing. Well, she was um, my guardian there, and I had the privilege to go back and to meet her as a woman. She has now um, been married. She has children. She invited me to go over for, for coffee. I was able to uh, meet this new Eileen who has um, dreams and hopes, who has now been able to put down roots and has uh, her own family and basically the bird watching is such an important experience not only just a, a pastime but it was also an opportunity of work for them once again what we've been trying which is basically to show and to communicate this with uh, so many talented people once again we had a second documentary which is called bird watching with FARC with more than uh, lots of views it is beautiful because it was done in a Spanish for Colombians with the best intention we could, trying to bother those people again that has been witnessing the conflict from um, far, uh, from some kind of a distance. And that's basically what I've been doing. I mean, showing the birds to people who come to visit us and communicating these um, uh, rural Colombia, these new ways uh, in which Colombia is moving forward and trying to be a bridge between these two Colombia, which are very, very far away from each other. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to be here with you. Fantastic. Diego, thank you so much to, to, to bother us. That's why we invited you to bother us with what you do. So now I would like to give the floor to Joaquine, if you're here. Hello. Yes, I'm here. How are you? It is such a pleasure. Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Joaquin Rodriguez. I'm from Venezuela. I'm a sociologist. I've been working for many years, working with the environmental conflicts in Latin America. And it is, uh, I mean, what I've done with this topic is my life, my research area, basically. Very recently, I started to work in Colombia. But before going to that, I would like to explain how I um, 
got to this uh, project because this project talks a lot about uh, my trajectory and how from the social sciences we can also have an important role on environmental conflicts uh, helping these environmental conflicts i would like to take some kind of distance really and to start and to go to lena's uh, presentation and to remember what she was telling us from her concept proposal and what she told us to really understand how science is not apolitical and which is the approach we use we have to have some position it is from this from this certainty that i always uh, position myself as a sociologist working within uh, the environmental topics but also trying to generate a dialogue between different knowledge and um, also the natural science and social sciences, but also together with the local knowledge. And one of the topics which has been my main concern from the beginning working on the environmental conflicts in Latin America has been the possibility of a dialogue with a more equity with people who had been historically excluded with uh, their knowledge not talking just from the science from the positivistic science which is the one we built up within the academia who are supposedly the ones who have the le really the uh, voice to do that but other kind of knowledge which had been always outside the academia and they're equally valid and it's important because they also have the possibility to contribute to the responses to the environmental crisis we are facing globally, but also in the way we have been building up the scientific knowledge, this has been left aside. And that's the main problem is the exclusion of the local knowledge. So what I do from my work is to try to generate a dialogue or intercultural dialogue between the local knowledge and the scientific knowledge that has to do with um, the topics of environmental crisis or environmental conflicts. It is from this idea of articulating different kind of knowledge that I've been working with different type of colleagues and projects within Latin America, generating methodologies and obviously using different methodological proposals. There's a great sociologist Mr. Gandora, he's a Colombian sociologist, very influential in this particular topic in a research area which uh, looks at how we build up this knowledge and how we integrate this with the local knowledge. This is from this area that I've been working, trying to have science to have a real contribution, a practical contribution to society, not only with um, useful knowledge, but also helping this uh, knowledge generation to be possible. We have a full methodological uh, approach of techniques and so forth that we can use to generate these processes. So from this perspective, I work, as I said, at the beginning in different areas of Latin America and also trying to uh, talk and to disseminate these um, power balances or imbalances that Lena also mentioned and to try to generate processes to try to overcome these um, power imbalances to help resolve the environmental conflicts. It is from this trajectory that I've had in different areas of Latin America working mainly with indigenous people who had been facing many processes of exclusion and displacement for the territories. It is with that that I, by chance, I arrived in 2018 in Colombia to work with a project I would like to share with you now. I'm sharing my screen with you right now, which is called the School, Territory and Conflict. I hope I can be able to share my screen. So this is the project. It is led by three organizations 
One has its headquarters in Bogota, works basically with the schools. We have the Bagay and its Anglia universities, the East Anglia universities, the university I'm working at the moment here in England. So this project was proposed in 2018 to generate a space so that in the post-conflict uh, context, we could make visible how the organization of the schools proposed a peace building process that is to say what we have been seeing and you as colombians more than i can know that the peace agreement open up a um, great deal of hope and expectation for the peace building but based on a, an agreement which uh, had been prepared by the government and the FARC, but we have so many voices and the communities also have their own voices, which had been very important uh, and they had been very much a presence in the community without much visibility. So this project basically aims at helping to build up the peace building process from the educational sector and from the community organization which responds to what the school organization and territories believe is a peace building process it is uh, basically we have a post-conflict contest based on a peace agreement made by two strong actors but the idea is to really to start to um, consolidate process which had been already going on in Colombia from organizations and the schools. And also we have the exclusive exclusion really also that sometimes these spaces don't have much visibility. So we've tried to generate a dialogue and research process where the schools themselves can be at a space to research what had happened with them, with the teachers, with the students during the war, during the armed conflict, what had been the impact on the education sector and how they do they, do they uh, envision the peace building process for the school teachers and the students and what does it mean peace the peace building process for the community organization so we're working in the south of tolima in four municipalities which is chaparral granada rio blanco and ataco and here in the web page, you can find in the participation, you can have the list of all the schools which had participated in this project. So we have the eight education units and also you're going to find the list of the community organizations, which uh, there are eight, as I said, two per municipality. And these community organizations, we have women led communities. Also, we have the coffee growers. Also, we have a youth-led organization. And also, we have the uh, grandmas, the knitting grandmas, and they also have been very important in the community. And also, some other social organizations which uh, self-call themselves indigenous and peasant organizations. What has been key in this project is not only to generate a space for the study and research from the school and community spaces, but also the aim has been to generate a dialogue between the school and the community so that together they can also propose um, techniques and processes to generate dialogue. So we've uh, generated um, workshops for exchange throughout a year and a half of research work. And in the web page, you can look at the different workshops and the outcomes of these dialogues exchange processes. At this moment, we're working on another page, which is the one I'm sharing with you right now. And it is the page which is going to be the place where we're going to um, gather all the outcomes of this dialogue and participatory exchange of ideas between the school and communities where basically we want to share with the general public the main outcomes we have produced throughout this research project. As Lena said, one of the most important things um, we have to have uh, when we talk about the political stance is to go beyond scientific papers. 
which is only going to be read by the peers. I mean, which has the other kind of outcomes and products we can produce from the academia. It's not only scientific papers, we can also produce um, videos when we give the voice to the communities to rebuild their past and help to make visible how they understand the peace building process. So we're working at this moment with um, participation, participatory videos made by the organization themselves talking about their views, their perspectives of the peace building process. Also, we're helping them to produce books where we help the chaperones women for peace to rebuild the institutional memory of 15 years of work as a network of uh, women making visible how they understand peace and what is the peace building process um, bottom up by this network of women. We also have some other kind of outcomes, which is um, basically trying to give a new meaning for these schools and communities in this uh, territory to be able to overcome the idea of Tolima as the um, red zone or the hot zone. Um, as a place known as a FARC territory. And for these people living here, it is very important to help to understand in Tolima, we also talk about some other kind of future, some other kind of outlook of the future. That's what this um, group of organizations from the space of the environmental peace, the women's groups, it is a space to reflect upon a different kind of future. So this research project aims to make visible not only what is the meaning of the peace building process, but also what may mean a different future for the people living in this region of the country. And with that, I would like to leave you some links. I believe also we've shared them in the chat of this uh, meeting. They are also are available. It is almost finished this web page but i can't access it let me see if i can move it here so i can show it to you so here is the the one on the maps and here you have the link this is the web page where you can access the talking map that we have created with all the different organizations to be able to simplify what the south of Tolima mean to them, which means basically to feel, to dream, and to give a new meaning to the south of Tolima. So these are the tools which are almost finished and they are available. We haven't yet finished the two last outcomes, these of the uh, speaking or talking maps, but hopefully by the end of July, they will be finished. I would like to invite you for the 17th and 18th of July, we're going to present the outcomes of this project through webinars and the communities and the organizations from the community, they're going to show their products, which are basically the talking maps, their books, their videos, that's going to be on the 17th of June at, I think it's 8.30 Colombian time. We can also, keep in touch through the organizing team of this uh, meeting. We can also disseminate the time and the day. And also from the scientific community, we can also discuss the findings of this event from a more academic point of view. And that's for the 18th of June. That's basically what I wanted to share with you. I'm here if you need any further information. Um, and let's see what the organizers say. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, that we also have uh, people here from the project from the University of Bagé and Eureka uh, Dukachiva, and they may have something to add at the end for the uh, questions that you may have. So they're here present as well. Thank you very much. Perfect, Yankine, thank you very much for everything. As Yankine said, the links had been shared in the chat here at the Zoom meeting if you want to access them. And also is yes, to encourage you to please send your questions because this is basically a discussion, a debate, and we would like to have your participation. And finally, to wrap up this first session, we have Pablo. Pablo, uh, we're a bit late, Pablo. So if you could, yes, well, just late. Thank you, Pablo. Okay, I would like to thank you all for being here, 
Thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation. My name is Pablo Palacios. I'm going to go very fast and I'm going to share with you some uh, slides. I'm going to just talk about that so we can go to the second part of this uh, meeting. I'm from what Diego said, the faraway Colombia. I call it the deep Colombia. That's what I like to call it. The deep Colombia is another Colombia, which is a bit detached from the reality it is very much marginalized from the main events which are going on in the main scenarios of the country it is the country really which doesn't really pay much attention to that region and chocuano from choco region very proud to be from there i will end to add on this uh, talk today to especially talk to you about the inclusion and to tell you about the racial inclusion in science in colombia I'm going to share my screen now with you. So, <laughs> when I start... Here we go. So here's my screen. I hope you can see it. Can you see it? Yes, great. So this is just some of the figures I've been able to gather um, reviewing and accessing the database on the inclusion data with regards to um, sciences and natural science on the Pacific coast, which is the region where I come from and I've spent most of my life. Well, also, I have developed my research career. So if you look at these figures, most of the training, most of the education in the last um, 18 uh, years, between 2000 and 2018, here we have about 22,000, 22,976 uh, people who had been uh, trained in education. And the natural sciences are here very much low with 1,300 people who studied maths and natural sciences in my region, in the Pacific coast. So if we look at this, we are facing a scenario in which one of the most diverse territory in terms of biodiversity, in terms of culture, is a multi-ethnic territory, has a very, very little scientific training by the young people in the different areas and fields of science, whether it is natural sciences or maths. And a question is why? Why is this happening? Why is this low number of uh, professional training of this kind of education in the uh, Pacific coast of Colombia in this scientific field? If we look into a, a postgraduate students, but just a few. I mean, the supply, it is much show, lower, much uh, lower for uh, to train scientifics or scientists in the territory, which generates a need to include even more and a need to generate the right conditions in the field so that people can have access to study sciences and to have this scientific training. And if we look within just an example on the region I'm talking about, which is the Pacific uh, coast, if we look at the four different um, states or departments of this area, we don't have any area specifically of the uh, maths or natural sciences, one of the main training uh, course in this territory. So we are facing a major issue, a major challenge, which I'm sure is going to be a topic of our debate later on. It's a major challenge on how this scientific training and tra scientific education is being generated in the field. Why don't we see much of this in some areas of the country and why people do have to migrate? They have to migrate to other areas of the country, even they have to go abroad looking for this kind of scientific training. In the Pacific region, those of us like myself who had been able to access scientific training, when we talk about uh, science, it is something like a uh, utopia, really. Some families look at the scientific um, course as something very uh, utopic, which doesn't really generate the um, answers to the social needs of the society. 
because it is a bit of a controversy really because we do have lots of environmental crisis the loss of biodiversity the desertification of areas we have adverse climate events which really need this kind of training this kind of uh, education for the young people we don't have this and then these young people have to migrate they have to look to to, to look for this kind of education somewhere else and as you know if you leave these areas you don't come back being the same if you leave this area you don't come back being the same person and once you go back to your original area you're not going to face the right conditions to develop your career now i would like to uh, told you very quickly something that uh, Professor Juan Camilo Cardenas from the Los Angeles University uh, mentioned when um, this is a study made in the capital when people uh, have gone through the uh, degree and they show their CV for some kind of jobs just the uh, fact that they do have some ethnic origin and the fact of having the picture in their CV, this generates exclusion when they want to access work in the capital. So they want, when they want to have a job, this is something that has been published. And I believe it is one of the main uh, aspects that we have to bear in mind when we talk about inclusion. So these people don't have the uh, conditions of uh, the study in, their, in the original uh, territories. They have to migrate and in other prices when they go to access a job they don't have these opportunities because of the geographical and ethnic origin this is a very recent piece of work it is a situation which really has to show us the need of debating and discussing inclusion both in science and in other kind of uh, fields of knowledge well, and something else that is very important and that we started discussing and dealing with at the University of the Andes is a very interesting work that I was also featured in The Spectator recently. And that is that when you are out of your own territory, you need to have a possibility to become integrated in it. And this is something that we see in Bogota when there's this fear of moving to other areas, to other neighborhoods, thinking that's going to affect their experiences as well as their training. So they are not comfortable moving across or moving through certain parts of the city and they tend to avoid it. And finally, I want to show you a little bit of what we have been doing it. This is what we do this is the um, incubator of the Pacific. And what we want to do is to provide high quality training here at the University of the Andes. What we wanted to do was to train roughly 20 young students, knowing that given the characteristics of secondary school education in this region had the opportunity to enroll in university and to pursue their studies. And what we want is to have this group of students to continue the debate uh, around inclusion and science as in other areas as well. So I just wanted to share this with you and now leave you back with the panel so we can continue with our debate. Well, thank you, Pablo, very much. It's very interesting to hear all the stats that you could share, um, especially about what you've been doing. So we're going to alter the order of our session a little bit, and we're going to move on first to Q&A from our audience. And then we are going, if we have time, or go over our own questions as well. ¿Cómo podemos hacer que la investigación... So we have some questions available here. And one of them is how can we uh, make sure that scientific re research becomes more diverse? 
And how can we work on this from different uh, approaches? Maybe Pablo can answer. Pablo, your microphone is muted. Okay, so would you mind repeating the question? Can we make sure uh, scientific research becomes more regional? How can we strengthen regional scientific academies? Well, we have to start by understanding that we are at a pivotal point in our national debate, all these um, debates around the centralization and hegemonic structures. So we have to now use this as a jumping board to see how we can create and strengthen science and opportunities built around science in the different regions. So people are uh, incentivized to either stay or return to the regions and work around this. So yes, people who might be um, training and getting the education at a national level or maybe abroad, and then uh, would like to go back to their regions, they do not find the opportunities they are seeking. So we need to create these social ecosystems so people can actually do what they want to do. So we can bring science closer to the regions. Another important point is that there is a certain confrontation that we had to bring to the debate as well. This um, confrontation built around the different forms of knowledge. So we had to take these different forms of knowledge and integrate them, something that we keep deb debating daily. So what do we really understand by scientific knowledge? So get all those um, usually unquestioned notions, put them on the table, debate them, and make them part of the scientific dialogue, both in our country as well as at a global level. Well, thank you, Pablo. Anybody else would like to answer this question? Yes, I would like to say something. Well, I live in Hamundi, which is um, maybe one of the hotspots for the social crisis that we are undergoing. And the feeling that I have is that we should not be focusing so much on regions, such as saying, okay, if I want to do something, I need to go to whatever region or place things are done better. So we have to instead focus on making sure people have access to education and that once they finish their studies, then they have access to proper employment. And that is something that happens in all those regions and territories that are not the country's main cities. So we had to make sure that the education and training opportunities are available where youth and young men and women are living and interested in learning. It's not about making scholarships available. Uh, the problem is that primary and secondary school education is so poor and deficient that is hampering opportunities for our youth in the future. So we not we have to narrow the gap, not only by offering scholarships to the best students, but by making sure that every single student is as good as the best. Because the truth is that regions 
do have very and offer very few and poor opportunities. So those who are good either go and study somewhere else or they just decide to relocate and work somewhere else as well. And that's part of the social conflict that we are dealing with. Well, we have to narrow these gaps. We had to close these gaps and do it in a way that empowers everybody in the regions and to avoid centralization because those who study medicine, law, and some other traditional careers, uh, their courses in the big cities are the ones who eventually end up running the country. So we had to empower people and just let, get them to understand and to learn uh, about the region, but also harness what they already know about their region, what they know about the nature and the environment in their own region and decentralize knowledge, not leave knowledge as something that is exclusive to those at the top of the social pyramid. And by empowering the regions, we're going to get people to want to come back, understanding and knowing that whatever is in their own backyard is really and truly viable and interesting, not only for them, but also for other people. And we can uh, tackle this not only from a scientific point of view, but a commercial one as well. We, myself, bring in tourists to my own uh, region to show it to them. So we had to empower people. Well, I would like to contribute my two cents as well, because we, what we've seen, especially in conflict regions and areas, considering that uh, conflicts, even though sometimes there are, and there have been agreements, there are still conflicts in some way or another, we have to help them envision a different future for themselves to help them understand what is the true meaning of a territory, uh, of a livelihood, of quality of life, how they interact with the environment and the territory they live in. So we have to create space for these other visions that traditionally never had enough room to grow and evolve. So we need to, yes, create opportunities, financial, economic, uh, economic opportunities, and so on. So we can, through higher education, build stronger bonds with the territories. So we had to give way and foster these opportunities so people feel more deeply rooted as well with the region and their territories. Well, thank you, Yukini. We are going to move on now to a different question. So why do you think the science practiced in Colombia does not respond to the needs and the reality of the territories. Whoever wants to go first. Well, I think that Colombia is uh, perhaps still looking for its own scientific identity. And the science that is being researched and practiced in Colombia does not respond to the reality of the territories, precisely because it is highly centralized. It is a, an approach and a perspective that looks more ab abroad than it does within. So this vision and interests in development are not applied to the scientific thinking dominant in Colombia. 
And to this regard, I don't think that we're doing the right thing. We know that about 55% of no natural resources are in rural areas. And the understanding that these communities have of their own natural resources are not take, is, is not taken into account by the scientists doing the research and the scientific thinking. So one of the things that we could do is precisely what we're doing today, open space for dialogue, invite academics, but also community representatives. So we can get both needs, both per perspectives uh, sit uh, at the same table and exchanging their views. Well, I agree. I agree with what Pablo said. I think that um, the models and the incentives used in our country is somewhat a copy paste of models used somewhere else. And as a result, the discourse and the perspective to which our scientific work answers is not our own, but something foreign. So I think that this is the main reason why scientists who live in a reality that is 100% affected by armed conflict, leave armed conflict out of the equation in their own work. Lesmaniasis is a disease which is considered to be a neglected tropical disease. And that is the mind frame with which this disease is understood to be a biomedical problem that needs a pharmacological response. And that is the kind of solutions that are being looked for and developed instead of broadening the scope and having a wider look at things and incorporating other variables that are not necessarily mainstream, mainstream scientific approach. Because yes, there are uh, drugs that can be developed to treat this disease. So we are uh, dealing with um, pharmacokinetics and with many other understanding. And we are talking about the evolution and the biology of the disease and so on and so on. But the reality is that those people that catch lesmaniasis live in very remote areas and nobody is talking about it. And now going back to biodiversity and any other research, the problem is that science does not contemplate the reality of the different territories is because science is not being practiced together with the communities. The questions science answers to do not come from the communities themselves. Scientists just come to the territories and tell them tell the communities what they found, but they never have a dialogue. And now that we are talking about post-conflict situations, we have, for example, bio expeditions that were an attempt to precisely harness the true richness of Colombia and to make the most of our own biodiversity. But we know that working with biodiversity and its protection is very difficult because we never add the communities to the table. We never ask them, include them in the conversation. And then many of the efforts fail because the communities just come and say, nobody ever asks us. 
So we have been living here and what we know is never truly used. And nobody asks us for anything. So if we don't ask them, if we don't involve them, then that's not going to work. So we are using the word biodiversity, but it's completely empty of meaning. What are we actually doing with it? We are looking at it from this perspective of uh, economic exploitation, even uh, piracy and other, other more centralized, even colonial discourses that give room and way to our questions, which in my opinion are not the right ones. Okay, may I add any something else? Well, I think that what Alina was saying about, okay, who is posing the questions? That is an incredibly important thing to ask. We are actually working on this. We are getting our research started and we started posing our questions and we actually were questioned by the academia, academia because of the questions that we were intending to ask. But we wanted to include the communities in our peace building process and projects. And what we were told was that there wasn't enough stability in the communities and the regions to for, for us to be able to ask these questions and do research on them, especially uh, right after the agreement. So we wanted to understand within that context of violence and because of armed conflicts, communities themselves have already engaged in a peace building process. So we didn't want to uh, foc focus on the armed conflict them itself, but on these peace building processes that communities had already started. And we wanted to talk to them, talk to them about how they build peace, which really open many different opportunities and avenues to reflect on peace and more particularly, how we transition for, from violence to peace, which is something that we wanted to discuss with the communities themselves, how they think about peace, how they reconnect with their territories and with their space. Well, thank you very much. Considering that we only have less than 10 minutes left, we are going to ask one last question. Uh, we can also continue uh, debating if you want, but I just want you to know that we have more ten, 10 more minutes with the interpreters. So let's go to this next question. So what can the academia do within the national strike demands? Yes, without any doubt, one of the symptoms, one of the symptoms that the national strike shows is the disconnection that happens between the different regions, the rural Colombia, the deep Colombia, but also what happens within the cities with the policies in Colombia and, and with the clowns that we have in government we've had recently, obviously, that's what we have to face. And in the field of sciences, very clearly, as it has been very well said in the previous uh, questions, I completely agree with them. We do have a sort of, we beat, uh, we gamble on a second hand or third hand plan of everything which has to do with the sciences and there is a um, centrality uh, approach of the country with the deep uh, 
Colombia with the sub-regions. And for example, for a, a family from Bogota, from Manayi, from Cali, the fact that uh, the nephew or the son studied biology or decided to go towards agronomy or natural science degree is regarded as a sort of less intelligent decision from the point of view of being someone in life or making money in life rather than if that person, this young person, chooses a different degree in Colombia. Until these changes, we won't be able to change some other kind of realities, which are very much based and has lots of gaps in the way we perceive the country. We love the speech that we are the country of the uh, orchids and the birds and the country of that biodiversity. But really, really deep down, we don't really know the country and we go uh, we don't go beyond what we see, uh, and it's more people abroad who really know what we have. So this uh, national strike is showing this, seeing that the rural Colombia, we are, obviously we are seeing the parliamentary uh, officers in the streets of Colombia, and we are just really saying, what was screaming? I mean, you have these people, these armed people, shooting people. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Colombia. This has been going on for so many years and decades in the countryside of Colombia. So this is our reality. We have to face this. The national strike maybe is opening up the eyes to um, so many people. I mean, it's an eye opener to what Pablo said, to the deep Colombia, to this Colombia, which is unprivileged because we're not the same, although we feel we are the same. So it is really a good shake up, I believe. I don't really know how the solution is going to come, but yes, it is bothering many people. It is bothering pe many people. It is an eye opener for many, many sectors of the society. It is really showing this Colombian reality closer to many people. That's for sure. Sorry, I would like to uh, interrupt once again, and we have been confirmed that we have 20 more minutes with translation into English. So if you could stay, the members of the panel could just uh, overrun for 10, 20 minutes. Perfect. Great. Fantastic. So if you want to um, just open up your mic and go ahead and answer the question. I'm going to reiterate something that I said for the young people who are there, who are the main characters of this. This is the young people, the students who are in the street in this national strike. I mean, the students are an important force, but they're not the main characters of this mobilization. I mean, the main characters are those who are saying, we are marginalized, we are excluded, we don't even have access to education. These are the main components of the uh, this mass mobilization, the national strike. And we have a very important uh, uh, question to the academia, why? haven't been able to reach these people in Cali. We have all the main universities in the southern area of Cali and the western or the less the, the sort of the eastern type of neighborhoods where most of these um, marches and protests are taking place. We don't have the presence of the universities in those neighborhoods. It is not really something that has to do with the regions that we're not reaching out to other regions of the country. Even in the same city, we're not reaching out to the young people who are the main characters of these protests. On the other hand, as we have already said, we have to pose ourselves um, relevant questions and to uh, tackle them in a relevant manner. Once again, going back back to the um, Lishmaniasis, uh, one of the things I've written and I've realized, and most of my uh, work has been done with the uh, members of the Colombian army soldiers, because um, most of the people affected by um, Lishmaniasis uh, in the country, these are the troops, which means they go through the treatment of, for Lishmaniasis, which is the standard treatment, is a very toxic treatment, and to the troops, they treat them once and then they go sent back to the uh, forest and then once again different cycles you can imagine to go through this highly toxic treatment against this disease which um, degrades the body at the end of the day many of them decide to retire from the army it's just because uh, they don't really uh, have the strength to put up with another cycle of treatment. A question for science. Why hasn't uh, anyone really uh, studied what happens to a human body, a young human body that has to go through so many cycles of toxic treatment against this disease? Another thing that the troops keep saying, it is a very important idea. 
and I'm just calling it idea because basically the science hasn't been able to give a response. And also the troops say that this treatment um, basically it leaves them without any chance to 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 make babies. So they are um, really that's a problem. That's a negative effect of this treatment for leishmaniasis. So that's a problem we have as scientists to be able to respond to these kind of questions. I mean, it is uh, something that has to do with lab work and it is the idea of working close to the communities, not only what people imagine that we work with the community, it is really that implies many different things with different kind of communities, in this particular case with troops from the Colombian army. And something I would like to say again is to work in an interdisciplinary manner. I do feel that the academia has uh, many, many debts because it keeps working in a separated way in silos. So we have biologists on the one side, and then on the biologists, we have the different categories in subsets of um, scientists who really have to cooperate and to really be able to work together to, to be able to answer these questions in a relevant way. Because many things uh, I find most interesting uh, topics for research for your social scientists. When I talk to scientists, I mean, I don't know, when I talk to Camila, uh, Gonzalo, she's uh, been facing amazing realities that for me, they are a great topic for research for her. It's an anecdote because she doesn't have the right tools to look into that or to research. She doesn't know how to tackle this as a research area because she's very much uh, in charge of some other kind of relevant topics. But it is precisely in this kind of interdisciplinary talks where I find out very important research topics. And this can be done talking and cooperating in that interdisciplinary way. That's the beauty in all of this. And that's it. Pablo? Okay, I would like to repeat two uh, ideas of what Diego said. What we are seeing today and the social um, discontent, the feeling of uh, being excluded, especially in the capital city in Cali, has uh, historically happened in the provinces of the country. Uh, this um, discontent, I mean, people like me who had been born, who had been uh, growing up in these provinces, we feel we had been disconnected from the country or the country has been disconnected from ourselves. And today we're seeing a mirror really of what historically minority groups and the um, societies in these different regions in the country had been uh, facing uh, in the country. So it is uh, an appeal, really, a call to generate more em em empathy, really, for the causes and for the fights and the struggles which form and transform the country. Another important aspect, obviously, Colombia has 50 million inhabitants where we have high levels of uh, illiteracy and of high level of uh, lack of um, basic education in great part of the population. Those of us who had been privileged enough to uh, have access to a uh, high quality education, we have a huge responsibility with the country. And I would like to call upon the scientists and the uh, uh, scholars to be more committed with the situation of the country. Let's move forward. Let's do something. Let's get out of our offices. Let's get out of the comfort of our computers. Let's get out of our labs and let's involve ourselves because the high degree of training and education we have received, let this be the incentive to generate more diversity of public policies in favor of communities, in favor of inclusion of sciences in the different contexts of the national life. So it is a, a an appeal, really, a call to feel more empathy and to take on more responsibility because of the uh, education we have received throughout these years. I don't know if Diego or Joaquinia would like to intervene and say something. I would like to. I would like to open up to a more sort of a regional uh, outlook. I don't think Colombia is here on its own. It is a very important uh, situation for the world in general. 
what is going on in Colombia, it has been gone, going on in the different uh, countries of the region in a systematic way. And COVID-19 has uh, laid bare the exclusion of most of the social sectors of our Latin American societies. So all this shows that we really need to take on seriously the need to rethink the development uh, models we have in the region. Colombia, as you very well know, we have this uh, legacy, this history, the longest history of the armed conflict, which the source is really looking for a more fair society. So, But we, we have to open up the horizons to the type of society and the type of development we want as a humankind. We really need to think about this as human beings, where are we headed to? And I believe in Colombia, not only to feel alone, because we do have the same uh, what is going on in Colombia in other regions, because it's a historical regional process, which is basically to challenge our governments to generate policies which really um, answer to a more equity, but also to a more sustainability from the social and environmental way of living to all of us. We have to think beyond what is going on in Colombia and to see and to regard this as a regional and international global process. It's important not to lose sight of this, to open up this debate to other kind of contexts. This also implies to think about the model of science and sharing of knowledge, as we have been mentioning throughout this session. Thank you, Yokine. Diego, do you want to add on something, or shall we just wrap up with the last question? Yes. Uh, well, uh, and um, drawing on what Yokine said, and also on what Pablo and Lina said, it is just like a summary of what has been said. It's basically to listen from the community towards the center, what people need, what people want to do. Yokine is in a very beautiful process in Tolima. Um, I'm going to visit a, a place in Tolima in two, three weeks, and it is the community of the coffee growers and the cacao growers and the indigenous people saying, you know what, we want to explore the options we have. I don't know, with um, uh, natural tourism, we do have a beautiful and interesting place. That's basically what I do. My biology is more romantic. And from some point of view, it's a commercial kind of biology to show people this. This is a decision made by the community themselves saying, yes, we want to be uh, curious. We want to see if our waterfalls, our environment, our birds, something we want to show up, and if something that we can also use to empower ourselves and to be able to live on this and to be able to have a better quality of life. I mean, we need to listen to the voices of the communities of these regions on um, processes, productive processes, to really look at the country upside down. I mean, we have always looked at the country from the capital cities onwards. I'm so sorry, I need to interrupt again in Chaparral and in Tolima and Chaparral, where we had the, um, where we have the, um, it is a city, Chaparral, which has lived very deeply the uh, stigmatization of Lishmanasis. It is where in Chaparral, where historically we had the largest outbreak of this disease. So it is very important. Unfortunately, I haven't had the chance to go there. I've had the opportunity to talk to many people from there, from Chaparral, and also we have so many opportunities to really think and reflect upon this. For example, the questions about the truth, reconciliation, re Operation in terms of things which look so far away from uh, war and peace, such as diseases and other kind of impacts, which are very much linked to that. The first thing we, we think about that when we think about war and peace is not diseases like this one. Thank you, Lina. And with that, just to end in the last 10 minutes, we would like to ask We would like to ask everyone beyond the armed conflict, obviously the conflict in Colombia has different dimensions. How do you think the Colombian conflict has affected science and you more specifically in your personal uh, context? How has this conflict in Colombia affected you as scientists? I would like to start because I'm the least scientist. 
traditionally speaking, of the whole team. I feel my biology is much romantic, it's a more uh, interpretive uh, biology, so it's not less or more, but in my case, it is an eye opener. Uh, it has allowed me to be more sensitive, more responsible as a political social person. I've been able to understand so many dynamics in the talks. I do something, I ask everyone, um, here we are almost 90 people at this moment. So I ask in my talks, how many of us nowadays after three years of how many of us had gone to a community of uh, former troops, former um, fighters who had been people like us and in the percentage is less than 1% out of these 100 um, people, not even 10 of us had been able to go back to visit this space of memory we have built in Bogota and we have compared how many of us had gone to Bogota just for um, tourism or going to La Candelaria, for example, as tourists. So I think in my personal experience, it has allowed me to take on a role which uh, is very organic and is um, some kind of um, internal fight inside myself to do something more. It has allowed me to be more sensitive, to listen to other realities and to uh, feel what others had experienced and to understand that we are all the same. I believe that has been, in my particular case, uh, the way this whole thing has changed me, my way of seeing things, my way of uh, doing science and doing biology. And now I'm going to let the doctors and the masters use the word. Pablo, do you want to say something? Well, personally, the conflict, I've lived the conflict since a very young age. I lost my parents, I've lost my friends in all this conflict of the fight in the rural context of Colombia. But this same conflict has allowed me to be very close to the needs and to the challenges and difficulties experienced at the region level, which I lived and experienced in the rural context, where the absence of the state, where the absence of the government has become many of the armed groups in the authority. And this authority has been expressed in different ways. I say these are very uncomfortable truths we have to um, see as Colombia. In terms of biodiversity, many people think, and even we do think sometimes, that most of the presence of this um, marginalized armed conflict uh, gangs, they had been able to preserve the nature in these areas because it hasn't allowed many external um, actors to do these extractivism activities to go there and to seize these resources as has happened in many other areas. But this same conflict has generated also too much violence and too much migration of people from the territories towards other places. It has generated poverty as well. So in terms of research, in terms of uh, leaving the conflict, historically in Colombia, this has generated many different aspects. Everything depends on what have what you have experienced, the way you have faced this conflict and the way you had taken on the conflict. And everything depends on how you are willing to answer the whole thing, because one of the main elements here is that many of the people and most of part of the society, they're just like fed up of this violence. They are fed up of this conflict. Something that shows this is what happened in the referendum a few years ago. The villages which had experienced more conflict and more deaths historically, these are the villages which were in favor of the referendum. So this is something that uh, comes to show us to think and to reflect upon what has happened. It is very food for thought for societies and for the scholars, how we have to face these dynamics of life and society when we have to go to these areas where historically the conflict has um, hit the hardest, these people.
So personally, well, um, basically towards the uh, mid 2000, that was the uh, sort of the peak of the conflict. And for us studying at the Los Angeles University, like myself, for my degree as biologist, I only had one field activity organized by the university. So we used to go to do to other kind of field activities by uh, organized by ourselves. But in the formal syllabus, we were only able to go once to a field activity because of the conflict. Another thing is also that in our degree, at least at that time, I hope this has changed by now, but um, this hasn't changed really. The way of asking questions and the way of answering these questions has changed. And uh, when I uh, started to study biotechnology, started to work with a lab, it seems to me that distance from the most relevant issues for me, among others, the conflict in Colombia, uh, the gap increasingly uh, was bigger and more frustrating for me personally. So yes, I do think that with the peace talks and with the peace agreement and with the non-implementation of peace, but at least with all the discussion surrounding the conflict and the peace we've had in the last few years, I believe each one of us had felt is a appeal also for the generation. That's why we are posing the questions we are asking ourselves. That's why we have this event because we feel we cannot be far from this reality, which really concerns us in deepest in our being. And in my work, the understanding of the leash menaces and the armed conflict is a wonderful case to understand precisely that a disease like this cannot be understood without having into account the armed conflict. I mean, if we don't understand leash menaces without looking at the conflict, um, close, we won't be able to understand the whole picture. And also, it is very much um, uh, wrong the way we perceive these things. Scientists who had been working in research in leishmaniasis, they had been daily affected by the reality of the armed conflict. They had had to uh, negotiate working conditions with the armed actors. I mean, they had to face uh, dangers which uh, wouldn't have happened in other kind of conditions. Also to develop uh, clinical trials with uh, troops and at every eight uh, days you have to board a helicopter to take care of your patients. I mean, this only happens here, which is impressive. It is very important to discuss this and to show this. Another thing I also believe it is important is in order to understand what science is relevant and is needed in a post-conflict or post-agreement era, it is important to ask ourselves what type of science was made during the war times or which type of science has been affected and influenced by the conflict and what happens and which are the transformation and which are the changes we have to implement so that this science can really contribute to peace with the uh, peace talks. So peace uh, has uh, became a term to use everywhere. We have peace, radio, peace and TV, peace and science, but we really have to seriously think about what is the meaning of a science for peace. How do we build peace from science? And then we obviously have all these uh, set of questions on what can we do? And also on the other side, to be very critical on the speech of peace, that is to say, what aspects of peace are allowing us to develop an unwanted processes for Colombia. As Pablo said very rightly, we uh, had uh, some areas during the conflict and now we have this uh, door now open to extractivist uh, industries. We have to really uh, think about the economic uh, model, as Inyokinia said. So under the discourse of peace, we cannot allow things now to come in. Is this the peace we want? Is this really the new peace we, we want? I mean, that's something important. We cannot just regard peace as an abstract idea. As Inyokinia said, we really have to understand what's the meaning of peace for the territories, for the people and the communities and institutions, which is the peace we want and how do we build peace from there? Well, one of the things that I would like to say and that I see 
hace Venezuelan being very close to Colombia, but not having come from Colombia as you are, is that there's a lot of emphasis on the study of violence in Colombia. But my work experience in the south of Tolima is that there has been for decades now, greater emphasis on peace and peace building. I think that Colombia is such a fascinating country. There's so much contrast, but also there's so much endurance and so much strength. And maybe that is something that because Colombians are too close to it, they cannot see it. And these knowledge and this highlight on violence is actually taken away from these tremendous peace building efforts that have been going on, this peace building undercurrent that has existed for decades and that um, the government and Colombians in general are not seeing. That is the other side of the coin, the other Colombia that maybe gets neglected and goes unseen. And then when we think about violence, we have to, yeah, we have to undoubtedly include the concept of peace and understand how it is brought about, the key role played by women, all these alternative cultural trends that are um, working towards development and peace and towards creating economic alternatives for the people of, Com of Colombia, because peace is not only the lack of violence, peace is the um, the growth and the development of many other things. And that is what actually beginning to grow now here. And I just sent a link to our chat in, here in Zoom asking, okay, so what's going on? I mean, what has been done? We have the native peoples in Tolima that has signed a peace agreement with the FARCs decades ago, and they have been living in peace between inverted commas with them for many, many years already. Well, thank you very much for um, all, to all of you, all the pan panelists and so on, uh, for your contributions, as well as to all our participants. I mean, we could not have held this event without you of course, and to the organizers that are working very hard behind the scenes, even if you uh, we cannot see their faces on the screen. So thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And I hope we can create more similar spaces so to this one so we can continue our debate. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for my fellow panelists, the organizers, and all participants as well. Yes, same here. It's been a pleasure. So I salute your initiative. Well, thank you, everyone, all of you. Thank you. Bye. We are going to plan more events, so keep an eye on our space, okay? Well, congratulations.